Well, well, hi, everybody. Welcome to Wired for Winning, episode 17. I'm delighted today to introduce Kevin Bailey, who um, who's actually from the Pacific Northwest, uh, Washington State in the United States of America. So right over on the other side of the United States, for those of you here in Europe and elsewhere in the world who listen to the podcast, um, Kevin is a, a, a very interesting character uh, with a background in a lot of different subject matters, but actually is his main body of work these days is is, is being an ADHD coach and a content creator and so on and so forth. And uh, I'm, I'm going to click the clapperboard, stop talking and let Kevin talk now as well. If <laughs> I can. Kevin, you're very welcome to the show. I'm going to click. Thank you I very much for joining. <laughs> that was a great introduction. Thank you. I'm, I'm happy to be here. I think you did that uh, really well. Um, yeah, I would say primarily an ADHD coach, also kind of sometimes considered like a neurodivergent coach because often as we kind of learn that, you know, people are dealing with ADHD, but often they're dealing with other things. They're dealing with neurodivergence as well. And I'll maybe we'll get into that. Yeah. But primarily ADHD, yeah, would be my focus. That's interesting. And yeah, we'll talk about neurodiversity and comorbidities as well that kind of yeah. exist, right? Like anxieties. But what, just give us a bit about you. Why your path? You know, what's your origin story that kind of led you to the ADHD coaching? There's obviously a fascination there, right? So I'm kind of yeah. interested in that. Well, I think that kind of my first answer probably kind of reveals some of the, my background and understanding, which is it's been a bit of a journey with, with me, with myself, trying to understand my own neurodiversity. For those that I don't know if you're if you're listening on a, on audio or whatever, but I am an African American male growing up in a uh, primarily middle class white suburb places in the um, and especially I think just being like a, a black male there was a lot of stigma within mental health. Um, and so I think I always had a feeling of other, but I never had the language of like, oh, maybe it's ADHD or maybe it's this thing, right? I I, I always felt like um, there was a, you know, a feeling of like, maybe something's not right. And I just felt a little otherized. And I think because of that, um, and this is actually something where I'll probably reveal as well is during that journey, I would feel like I would have trouble paying attention and being disorganized. But I also felt like a little bit of an alien when I was a kid where I would kind of go off and do my own thing and I just, you know, kind of figure things out on my own. And as I got older, I really wanted to figure out how do I connect with humans? <laughs> how do I become a human? Um, because I was always, I often found myself confused. I would over speak. Um, I would get in trouble for things that I didn't realize I was getting in trouble with. I would try to pay attention in class and I, you know, would realize that class, I felt like, wasn't really like met for me because I just couldn't do it. So I was like, oh, this is just a cabin thing. So I went, I'm going to learn how to be a human. And so I would say right around, around high school, I started to just learn about human behavior and human behavior change. And I hope that one day, someday soon, I'll be able to be, you know, as a human, right? And be, be, be a human somewhere in the future. And I think it was through that kind of interest and passion of just trying to learn how to be a human and how to kind of move in the world that led me on the path to eventually um, move into um, a lot of human behavior type roles. So before I was a coach, I was a, a consultant, a, a human behavior consultant, a human capitalist consultant, meaning I okay. helped employees you know, um, with well-being and leadership and different things, because I found it was just naturally interesting, organizational psychology. Mm. And from there, that kind of led me on the path, which we'll probably get into at another time. But there was kind of the, the, the paper, the paper trail to, okay, human behavior. I don't understand humans. I'm going to learn human behavior. I'm going to go into, uh, you know, organizational psychology because I need to make money as an adult. And this is something that I'm still interested in. So I'm going to do that. And I now kind of move into the, the, as I understand kind of the full package of who I am, I'm now into kind of ADHD coaching and neurodiversity. Gotcha. That's fascinating. And it, it's, you know, what you've described there is over the last 16, 17 episodes of this, talking to people with ADHD themselves who are either you know past diagnosed, being diagnosed late, or, or yet just to be diagnosed, that feeling of being different, right? The uh, as you described, the word you used, feeling other otherism. I think was oh, yeah, a, a, otherized or just something otherized. that was quite a, a, a little off. Like there was a little, like I I felt like I always said like speaking an accent. Like I would you know hear you know hear somebody and go like 
we're talking the same language, but I speak a little differently. And I couldn't quite figure out what that was. That's, do you know, it's very interesting. There's a guy by the name of Richard Bandler. I don't know if you've studied neurolinguistic programming ever. Um, yeah. I you into know it, yeah. the subject. Yeah. And, and, absolutely. and when I was going through my journey, he was talking about the language that people use. And some people use predominantly the audio center in the brain. So they'll use audio words like, I hear what you're saying, right? Some people visualize stuff in their brain and they'll use visual words like, I can see that picture, right? Or they'll use kinesthetic words like, let's touch base on that. Three different types of language. And I always thought that I was different because. I'm very audio. I, it sounds mean a lot of shit to me, right? They really do. And, and I don't really, I do make pictures in my head, but not that much. And I felt different, like, like you say, but you know, you talk about 90s LA. I, I, my only experience, I've been to LA, but, but in the 2000s, 90s LA kind of rings up like pictures of uh, movies, right? And, 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 and a challenging time, right? For, for, for everybody. So, how did you, did you get diagnosed at that time yourself or, or how did that work? Yeah, no, that, and that's actually one of the reasons I wanted to bring up like the history of, you know, being a black kid in, in the nineties is the idea of being ADHD or doing anything was considered like, you know, you were like, oh no, 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 we want, we want to make sure like your, your family and, you know, your, your, your community be like, no, 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 long as you're okay, long as you're you know, doing what you're supposed to be doing in general, you're fine. You're fine. We're not going to put a label on you, uh, you know, a mental health label on you because that's seen as lesser. That's seen as brokenness. And um, I think especially within, you know, really the culture of African-Americans, I think it's a main reason why a lot of African-Americans can really struggle with getting access to mental health because it's installed in your kind of head at an early age that, you know, you don't have mental problems. You just need to figure it out. I um, mean, so it wasn't until I was really late into my late twenties that I started to recognize that I was struggling in a lot of areas. Um, that I started to get my 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 understanding, and that's how I got my ADHD diagnosis. Um, and then on, on top of that, and this is where I probably will, will reveal the reason I kind of see neurodivergence is I, I also learned later on um, a few years ago, that I'm also autistic, which is one of the reasons why I struggled with understanding how humans worked as well. So it was, you know, just this kind of neurodivergent brain that I had of both, you know, both kind of tied to the exact functioning of like, I struggle with attention, but I also struggle to like understand, experience, and respond to um, the processes outside of the world. And that's what often happens is there's often a very much an in uh, intermingling. Probably not saying that word right. Intermingling. No, you are. Yeah, um, no, no, oh, it's good. Good, good. An intermingling between multiple things when you're dealing with any kind of neurodivergence, right? So it's it's very much the exception, not the rule, if you have ADHD, to not have to deal with anything else. And so that's actually one of the things I really try to advocate for for people is like often it's like the ADHD is often one of, of, of other things that you can be dealing with, almost always anxiety or some form of depression um, as well. They're all very related. And I think I needed to, over a span of time, start to better understand like the full story and i'm still learning the full story of my brain that's kind of fascinating you you describe that time and and you know you, you know that the society that you grew up in as well and i'm 54 and i grew up I was, i'm left-handed and in the school i went to i was told to put my left hand behind my back like this and they gave me a pen sill a pen and a pencil and i was forced to write with my right hand and I was actually downgraded. Like, I don't know how the class structure works in the United States, but you've got like poor. what I call the... <laughs> I would say, poor. <laughs> like, yes, it's not not great. Not a huge fan, but go ahead. At least <laughs> you know, some of the main ways. Go ahead. But, 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 but interestingly, like you've got, if you, you have like, say, an English lesson in school, right? You've got the, the, what I call the really bright kids. And then you've got the second tier, the third tier, the fourth tier. And, and kind of by the time you're getting to the fourth tier, you know, the, 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 those kids are not being given a lot of help. And, you know, I, I was always really lucky in school because I, 
It's not an intelligence thing. It's just I learned very quickly information. And I think people with ADHD do, and they get bored because it's like, hurry up, move on to the next thing. And if you don't give them the right speed, you know, um, I, think, I don't know. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. I think it's, this is why I, um, I know you, you mentioned me even in the beginning, like, and I like just the title of your, your podcast, like Wired for Winning. It's not like we, we sometimes I think have these ideas of like, everything is a disorder. Everything is a, a, like you are less than, or you are, this is the standard. This is, this is what normal is. This is what typical is. Right. And, um, if you're not aligning with typical, then you're lesser <laughs> Then you've yeah. done it. You're doing it wrong. If you're not writing with your right hand, you're not doing it right. So our work should be to just teach you how to be, you know, learn how to be, you know, write with your right hand better, even though you're left handed. And yeah. we don't take a second to go like, well, hold on, wait a minute. Yes, there are some people that can write with the right hand really, really well. But that doesn't mean that there might not be advantages for people that are writing with their left hand. Maybe we want to focus on helping you write better with your left hand and not always just focus on getting it back to the, you know, normal, typical of writing with your right hand. Yeah, it, it, it's it's kind of interesting, and and certainly not to feel lesser than, right? You know, whether whether you you're coloured or you you you're left-handed or you know you're autistic, you're, you know ADHD or or, or or whatever. But I I kind of you know societally, and and what we'll do is we'll we'll swan dive, if I may, later on into the kind of the the very small aspects of autism and ADHD and comorbidities that you mentioned, like anxiety, Kevin. But what sure. I'm kind of interested in at this time, it, it, at this section, is that two things. One, the improvements in you know living in the United States, and I'll, I'll generalize, if I may, from the '90s to now on the general principles and approach to neurodiversity. Um, and uh, yeah, I'll, I'll start with that if I may. And just, you know, has there has been the, improvement from that well, kid in the nineties, you know, that really suffered with otherism, if you like, and, and to now, are you able now to, to kind of be open about your neurodiversity and uh, as a coach, you help people, but you know, or, or ha has the world in the United States come a long way or not? I think if there certainly has been more improvement, one is just, we've, I think, have learned a little bit more about what some of these things can look like. Um, a lot of some of the original data that we've got about a lot of you know, mental health issues or, or disorders or right come out of Harvard studies of like, you know, white males kind of, right? And so it was like, hey, this is the, this is what, you know, white males are experiencing. Therefore, this is, this is the disorder, but we don't necessarily see the intersectionalities of so many different other traits and, and, and experiences, what it could look like in a woman, what it could look like with somebody of color, uh, uh, what could look for different geography, different economical situations, right? And while I think as a society or here in America, we're not quite there in terms of fully recognizing this, certainly not in like, you know, corporate environments, which is, which is where a lot of these struggles, you know, happen. We do have more language about it, right? The idea of neurodiversity and like the neurodiversity movement is very much tied to this idea of different, not less, right? And so I think um, there's definitely been some progress, but there's still a long way to go, certainly. Yeah, I, I would tend to agree with you, actually. And it, it's fascinating because living here in Ireland, if I look at the United Kingdom, uh, you know, the UK where I'm from, Ireland is kind of behind the UK from a, a societal standpoint. Interestingly, I interviewed a, a, an Asian lady last week who lives in London, went to the London School of Economics, has a master's degree, is also ADHD autistic. Um, and she was telling me about how she felt coming from an Asian family that categorically looked down on self-medication, like, you know, drinking alcohol, as some people with ADHD self-medicate, and, and how she constantly had to have a mask up because she was taught as a person, as a woman, that you have to behave in social situations in a certain way. And I Use your right hand. Use your right hand. You have to use your right hand. Yeah, <laughs> you have to use your right hand. But I, 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 you know, as as somebody with ADHD myself, Kevin, I, I struggle sometimes in social situations. Like 
talking to you right now, I'm really comfortable because I'm in my office and I'm in my environment that's comfortable. And, you know, I can go out and be the most sociable party person there is. And yet other times that can flip around 180 degrees and go, oh my God, I'm sweating. I'm anxious. Things don't feel right. Am I picking up on social cues from other people here? Am I being foolish? Am I clever enough to understand what they're talking about? Or or am I being overly chatty? You know, stuff like that. But societally, I was talking to a lady about a month ago, and she's in New Zealand. Annie mm. Romanus is her name. And she was telling me that they had a prime minister down there, like a president, right, who was elected at the age of about 28. And when she was elected, she piled so much money into the mental health system that it kind of accelerated the uh, the, the, the training of professionals, the, you know, the, the, the screening of individuals in a neurodiverse environment. And it was, she said it was wonderful. And then unfortunately, that person then lost in the next election and all that money was taken away. So while they saw the benefits, it was taken away and they've kind of taken a step back. Um, certainly here, and I, I've related this story a few times now, I remember moving house here in Ireland, um, just outside of Dublin, and uh, I changed my doctors, my general practitioner. Um, your medical records go to the new GP, the new doctor, and I said, uh, can I get uh, my prescription for my meds, please? And he refused point blank to prescribe me medication. And I said, but I have a psychiatry letter. I've been prescribed this for 12, 10 years now. And, you know, and he said, no, I don't believe in it. And I said, okay, I respect your professional opinion. I have no choice but to go back to my other doctor, you know, mm -hmm. um, and, and that's five years ago. And still, certainly, and again, we're coming and we're moving forward. Um, here in Ireland and the UK and around the world, I'm seeing that happen. But you're right on the data and the statistics. It's about white, naughty males, right, who misbehave in school. And any of the research I've seen doesn't cover the geographies, the, the races, the ages, and, and certainly the sexes, right? You know, there's a lot of talk over in this part of the world about, you know, women with ADHD who internalize their behaviors and stuff. but Goodness, I mean, there's so much more to learn, right? It's yeah, definitely. May I ask? Sorry, and the the fun thing about doing these these podcasts with two people with ADHD is I struggle <laughs> as I'm I sure others do. I was with you. I was with you. I was along for the ride, so I enjoyed it. And you're right. You know, I think that there's a lot of truth in what you said. Go ahead. No, no, no. That, thank you so much. But 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 tr trying to be quiet and let other people talk is my my Achilles heel as well. Tell me. <laughs> With regard to, again, your, your own ADHD and autism, yeah. are, are you open to the world about that? And I, what I mean that is in a personal sense. I know clearly professionally you probably are as well, and I, and I don't want to assume that. But tell me about that, because I do. Yeah. I'm open with everybody, you know? Yeah, yeah. It's a really great question. I, I, I think often I'm very open about it within my business uh, and within, you know, um, you know, my family. I also recognize that even the word autism for some that may not have as much education on what autism could actually look like, um, I think uh, don't always reveal that because I don't think it's necessarily helpful without having more of an understanding of what autism looks like. I think that there, I, I think what I do is I very intentionally decide, one, does this person, has this person kind of earned my story, right? I don't need to reveal all of my story to everybody. Um, I think that that's something that I get to decide what it is and how I think someone's going to take my my, my story and, and use that mm. story. And, and, and two, do I have perhaps a little bit more time and if they're maybe not as familiar with what autism looks like, if they're not as close to it, to explain what that really entails and looks like. Because I think a lot of folks, and it's okay, we all have, there's so many different types of divergences and different things. We can't all grab things, but often, you know, the, the instinctive, you know, stereotypical autism is like, oh, that guy from, you know, Rain Man, right? Um, that, you know, was just really good with numbers, right? Or the kid in the, you know, you know, white kid with it, you know, that does a train and doesn't speak or different things, right? And you go like, 
you're not that like, what? like, no, Kevin, like that's not, you know, that's not you. And so there, there is sometimes a little bit of and coaching is not the right word, but there, there is sometimes a little bit of like, I, ha I, I feel like I want to make sure that I can share in a full way of context, especially for those that may not necessarily understand the nuances of what autism really is, um, especially, you know, based off of what we know right now. Yeah, that's, it, it's very interesting for you to say that because that's an incredibly tough set of, I hate to use the word comorbidities, but, but, but it kind of is because, yeah, absolutely. you know, the things that are typical to ADHD are almost equal and opposite with autism, right? When you, you talk about, you know, the different, yeah. the different aspects and, you know, I, I've learned a lot about the two conditions. What I have one, I don't have the other, but the conflict internally that one must feel as a result of that on any given day has <laughs> got to be no wonder that that Exhausting. phrase overwhelmed. Yeah. It's yeah. exhausting. It's like my, my mind is a series of paradoxes. And you're right. I'm, I'm glad that you kind of mentioned that because it's true. It's, it's a seesaw because um, it, it is somewhat seemingly contradictory. Um, and that's what makes it, I think, sometimes even harder to one, even see, right? And even if you're, you know, like me, who has spent so much of their life in this work, still trying to navigate those two sides of what can feel like two sides of my brain is extraordinarily fatiguing and tiring. It really is. No, I, I share, I share that because I wake up some mornings and this is I, like, I have ADHD. My commodity is, is social anxiety. Right. And, and you know, on, I, I have clever days and I have stupid days. <laughs> I'm not kidding. This is how it works. I will roll out of bed and I can tell you within about five seconds. And I say this to people sometimes, I can tell you what universe I am in today. So I'm either in a clever universe or I'm in a stupid universe. And clever universes are great because I can do everything. I can function way above. And on those days, I don't take my medication, right? On stupid days, I struggle to even read text on a page, to do simple mathematics. And on those days... I take medication because it will bring me to here so I can at least function in, you know, the day job and, and stuff like that. With AUD, ADHD. Yeah, ADHD, sometimes referred to ADHD, AUDHD. Thank you. ADHD and autism. And um, autism. Kind of, kind of colloquially. Thank you for that. I, I'm of delighted course. that you actually said that properly because it just didn't come out of my mouth properly either. <laughs> but with those conflicting things that are going on at the same time, you say it's exhausting. What have you learned to do in terms of functioning, you know, day to day? Because we can't all just go, oh, listen, lads, I'm switching the TV off today. I'm switching the, P the laptop off and I'm not working. Right. I, I, I mean, I, I'm assuming that, that you, you, you can function. How yeah. do you do yeah. that? I mean, is it just lots of coffee or, or what's the story? <laughs> well, I think part of this is it's, it's, a, it's, it's such a journey. And I, I heard this is a very common experience for those that were kind of diagnosed with autism leader in life. Because often, if you're able to kind of get by, as they say, and not, you know, be shown to, you know, like, oh, you're autistic, often you have learned a lot of ways to kind of mask whether consciously or unconsciously a lot of your um your preferences that can be fatiguing um but you've kind of learned through one through through practice and through skill that to kind of cope with it uh but it's it's very common and i'll say it certainly has happened to me uh, several times uh, what happens is you you or at least within my experience often you'll you go like, oh, I can do this. I can, you know, I can work. I can, I can work without you know, being interrupted. Or oh, oh, that noise is still loud, but like I'm just gonna just concentrate and do that. Oh, okay, I, you know, I'm just gonna just make sure that I, you know, not over talking and being communication. Oh, okay, I'm gonna make sure I'm gonna look somebody straight in the eye. I'm gonna make sure I smile. And you're doing all of these like scripts and things, and you're just kind of doing this in the background, kind of running up. But eventually, what can happen is over extended periods of time, whether either the stress gets more intense or it's just, you know, you're doing it so long that there's often a crash. You hit a wall 
and you burn out, <laughs> you burn out. Um, and it, it can be very easy to do with high masking ADHD years or those who are autistic as well. Um, and ADHD for that matter too. And so what I've had to learn through that mainly, and this is where I kind of go like, I had to, I've had to have so many talks with myself to be like, you know, you always have these like imposter syndrome. Oh, you're not artistic. Oh, you're not the issue. Oh, you don't have these things. And you can lie to yourself and go like, oh, okay, no, I'm good. But then I would hit the same problems. I would get burned out. I'd hit things. And so what I have learned over time is to treat my body and my brain with, and myself, frankly, give myself more self-acceptance and to design my environments and my life and the way I live the world, uh, the way I want to go with the world in, in more resilient and ways that aren't as, that don't provide as much prolonged stress. Um, and that is, that takes years and in some ways I'm still on that journey, but how I've navigated it in to make that very long story short is I've designed my life more intentionally as I've learned about myself so that I am not as constantly overloaded with so much information and input um, from, you know, things that don't work with the way my brain really likes to work. Yeah, that's actually fascinating to, to hear you talk about that. And, and by the way, I'm just going to say this, listening to you talk about the way you handle it and that you're still on the journey is so great C compared to others that I, I talk to, say, in, in the UK or, or in, here in Ireland, where maybe the societal influences and, and the, the education isn't maybe not as far advanced. And I don't want to I don't want to kind of say that that is true. It's just listening to you talk. You kind of sound like you've got it together. If that makes sense. Um, well, I'm and, pulling and... somebody. But I mean, I, yes and no. I'm going to give myself a little more credit. Like, I, I've worked hard. It's earned. I've definitely, you know, put myself together. But, of course, I still have problems and, and issues that I constantly face. Um, of course. Yeah. yeah. It, it, look, so, it's not go going ahead. away. Yeah, but, right, but it's not right. going away, right? You, you know, these are these are lifelong conditions. This isn't uh, the flu, or it's not COVID, right? You you don't get a, right. a, a a shot to get rid of it, right? It's 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 a <laughs> lifelong condition, and it's different. It's not lesser. I and and I take your phrase on that from earlier. But specifically, then you, you talk about designing your environment, right? Yeah. And you talk about you know, are there aspects of you and your routine that you maintain now that manage your you know your brain is exercise one do you if you don't mind me asking do you take medication do you yeah. do you have the nutrition is there any kind of areas in the you know those particular areas that you you've learned help and 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 typically are there any disastrous things you know that 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 you've done and you've gone wow i won't be doing that again yes to both um <laughs> i i think and this is uh this is where i kind of get into this is why i enjoy coaching because this is in many ways what i coach others i'm on the journey often with my clients but i i have also along that journey have come up with methods and frameworks to build a, a life that is more resilient and more thriving given given your circumstances of your of your life right um and so what i do is exactly what i uh coach my clients on i always like to say it, that i am my number one client as a coach um and so i have you know it's 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 kind of built through a process of the technical term is used design thinking, which is basically a way to solve problems through understanding the user. In this case, you're the user, I am the user and kind of experimenting your way forward. Uh, and as you experiment your way forward, you kind of build habits and systems to improve. So to answer that question, the things I've done is first is I've gotten really good at learning about myself. I've taken the time to get clear, like, what are my values? What are my, what would I do if I had no other obligations, right? If I, if I didn't have to, you know, I didn't know anybody, anything, how would I be spending my time? Um, what are my energy levels? When am I most engaged? When am I less engaged? Right. And, you know, taking assessments of like you know, personality and just getting clarity on this is the user, this is myself, right? And then not just 
like theoretically, because there's part of it is journaling and reflection um, and understanding, but then there's also just general observation. So I go, okay, I, I think I believe in this. I think I do that, right? But then I want to see how I'm actually applying this in day to day. What am I actually doing throughout the day? How am I actually feeling? Um, I have, you know, trackers like right here. I have like my little distraction trackers where I write things down. So I go like, oh, you typically get distracted here. You know, I have like end of the day, just quick journal exercises. Felt great this time. Didn't feel as great this time, right? And so I kind of gather that data. And then I look and go like, okay, so what's the big problem here? What are the things that, you know, are, you know, big, you know, roadblocks? Okay, maybe it's this, maybe it's that. I ask myself, and then I become like a little bit of an experimenter. And I ask myself, what do I think I should do? And what's my hypothesis? Hypothesis. You know, I believe that if I, um, you know, if I'm not new using uh, chat GPT so much, because I put it right there, and I just didn't do that for a week, I might be more productive. I might be less distracted. Let me test that out for a week to see if that's true, right? Okay. And I capture that information. And as I build all of these things up, you start to get a picture of who Kevin is and how he does that. And I put in little systems to kind of help move me forward. And I've done that for years, years okay. to kind of collect so that I'm better at kind of understanding what my optimal environment is so it's that's kind of the process of how i do it and how i kind of coach my clients as well that's kind of fascinating you're data driven and and i'm going to show you this this is my pad of paper my distraction pad look love it with all the things and every time Great. i have an idea and that's on this side of the desk there's like written notes and i i kind of go through them and where is and i, oh, and I have this as well i have my pomodoro timer yeah, oh, of course. I, I would yeah. say a Pomodoro, because I'm obviously an ADHD coach, it's like a Pomodoro uh, timer for like an ADHD coach is like an apple for a teacher. <laughs> it's like, yes. so like everyone like has that same Pomodoro timer. It's, it's, it's just true. like, it's like, it's like a ruler or like a stethoscope or whatever until when that thing like the doctors have and stuff. It's like, yeah. ADHD coaches yeah. have the timer, the Pomodoro timer. <laughs> From a exercise and nutrition perspective, does the data kind of bring you anything back as far as that's concerned or... It, I, it, yeah. Yes, it definitely does. And I should say too, let me let me balance that that I am definitely more methodical often not uh, folks that are autistic are typically more methodical and analytical. Uh, but I also learned the human component of it, it, things aren't always objective. There's sometimes subjective experiences that need to be in there as well. So while I am you know, heavy data driven. I do also sometimes try to take a step back and just go like, okay, but like, what do I, Kevin, like, what do you actually need right now? I have really worked very hard on self-compassion and self-acceptance because I find that that is, you know, we're all struggling and we're all um, dealing with our own pain. And I find that when I am most centered, I am giving myself a lot of self-compassion and I'm giving myself a lot of empathy. And then I am using that, um, that energy to, extend that to my clients and I allow them to feel more self-accepted and compassionate too. So yes, there's a heavy data driven part of it, but there's also the humanizing. The human, the, the human as well. and the emotional element, or yes. if some would call it the spiritual compassionate element, if you like. Funny enough, I think sometimes, you know, I was looking too late, and so I sometimes think it's like the ADHD and the autism. Like remember like the paradoxes, <laughs> like that's my paradox. Like ADHD is more like, Divergent thinking, big ideas, you know, like, well, let's just, you know, do what feels right in the moment. Don't always, you know, get into the boring yeah. stuff. And then my autism's like, yes, but make sure you have a checklist. <laughs> make sure That's you observe there too, and you write it down and you put that as well. So <laughs> I love that so much. Do you know, it's very funny, actually, because in my small ADHD brain, if you like, I, I go, right, well, we must have this process, right? This process has got to be perfect. And then I'll go, oh, sod it. And I will deliberately destroy that process and go off for a couple of days on a on a completely different, self gratifying few days of no, that process is rubbish. And then I'll come back to the process, you know, yes. getting up in the morning, taking a shower, cleaning my teeth, the small stuff. You know that I know that if I do that every single day, I will get to do the important things in my life as well. There's um 
there's a gentleman you, you may not know him he's he was born in Botswana so he's African British I think he's become a very successful entrepreneur over here in in Europe anyway his name is Stephen Bartlett and he has a um he has a, a podcast called the diary of a CEO and um and he he's kind of um I, I don't know if he's made it into the states yet. I've heard that name. I've heard the di- I've mean, not looked into it, but I remember seeing that come up. The diary of a CEO. So please tell me more. Uh, well, he he's he's kind of done oh, hundreds of episodes of this, and it's really all about the the fundamental concept of the podcast is around how good CEOs operate in good business. But last year, and he's been running this for four or five years now, but last year he actually came out and said, I've been diagnosed with ADHD. And yeah. it's, a, it's a wonderful thing because like my experience, like I said, I think it was just before we started recording, you look at some of the organizations and they quote from this research, you know, people are five times more likely to commit suicide um, with ADHD or they're five times more likely to end up in the judicial system with ADHD, which by the way is probably true, but it doesn't have to be right. It doesn't have to be. And, and Stephen talks about telling, and I learned this the other day, I was reading his book and I learned this the other day and he was talking about go back and tell your origin story, right? That has an emotional component to it and i was like jesus and and i i kind of cross-referenced that with something else that with the japanese use and uh, you alluded to this briefly about the masking and the japanese say there are kind of three masks you know there's the one everybody sees then there's the one only you know friends and family see and then there's the one that nobody sees right yeah and he was like dude go back to the origin story take off all three masks and go out to the world with that and I actually, strangely enough, it's funny to talk to you about this because I actually wrote this guy an email today. And the first line of the email was, Stephen, I, I know you're probably never going to read this, but I need to write it. And I went, I'm terrified to tell my origin story in public. I'm terrified, you know? Yeah, and, and yeah. Does that resonate I, with you in any way? It, it I don't does. know. I, I think sometimes it's, that's more easier said than done. Often times people that like, you know, the first step when you realize that we have this mask that everyone has, right? And it's like, oh, the mask. And like, what do you do? Like, oh, right. Well, then it's time to just throw off the mask and be you, right? I think that that is a much harder question than we give our, like, we give it credit for. The idea of like, who the hell is George, right? Who the hell is Kevin? Because in many ways, we have spent our entire lives kind of acting right like we have these roles that we that we play right where i always say like we're all like playing adults right like, we're all you know like we're all trying to be like look at look at i'm, I'm doing what i'm supposed to be doing and so the idea of like being able to just easily remove this mask and just be a hundred percent you is actually really hard for most people because they have no idea who they are they don't like am i being authentic now am i less authentic or not authentic right and so i i think what it really requires is a lot of patience, observation, understanding with yourself, and also realization that there is there is no core you. It's it's who you want to be, right? How how you want to show up in the world for yourself and you know, maybe for others as well. And so I like the idea and that concept of doing it. Uh, I, I think that it's also important for others to understand though too that it's a journey that takes time to uncover some of you know, your true self, whatever that even is. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think you're right, actually. It's it's kind of funny. One of the things that I've learned doing this this particular podcast and, and beforehand as well was as a as a man, being vulnerable is also a big challenge. And what I've learned to do, certainly within the context of this podcast and, and in life now, is I'm actually okay to show that i am vulnerable as as a man and societally that hasn't been acceptable up until recently and and maybe in some parts of the world it still isn't but what i have noticed kevin is showing my vulnerability and and that's not demasking by the way just but showing my vulnerability has reaped a greater connection with other humans than i had ever imagined it would 
Why know? do you think that is? Yeah, it's a great question, actually. And, I, and, and I'm so pleased to be asked questions as well as ask questions on, on, on this, this particular show, right? Because, and I think what it is, is because you step out and you go, look, I'm not invincible. I am. And other people then, I think, in the interest of the human condition, also all of automatically say, no, I'm not either. And you get that connection. And and I really value connection. There's a guy, um, there's a TED Talk from a long time ago that talks about, he's an English guy, and, and I'll send you the link afterwards so you can watch it if you want, but it talks about um, drug addiction um, and, and the, the, the drug epidemic around the world. Right? And he, he references uh, uh, Portugal, the, the country of Portugal, and, uh, and what they did in Portugal to overcome the problem. They said, look, you know, we can't, keeping drugs illegal in the world is, is actually probably adding to the problem and he references the u.s with prohibition you know when it happened they said look at prohibition that didn't work right and and he said in portugal they decriminalized everything and he said he talks about drug addiction and and he said it's not around the the substances that are inherently addictive it's sobriety comes from human connection and if you make things illegal you are separating human beings from each other and the parallel i draw with the vulnerability thing is is maybe the connection with other humans who also feel vulnerable it is kind of an important thing and what little bit i play in the world as, as i'm sure you do with the work that you do kind of the more connection i get from other humans the I certainly, the better I feel, and I think the better they feel too. So the journey I'm on is about more human connection. I love that. I feel, I get a great feeling from it. It's emotionally wonderful to, to do that. I hope that's answered your question a little bit. It, absolutely. You know? um, and I think it answered it uh, quite well. And I, I agree. I think I know that a sense of belongingness is an essential need for humans. We are evolutionary programmed to need belonging as much as air, water, and food, right? And I think, again, I say I think, but again, I know that we're all dealing with really deep bouts of, of, of shame. You're not good enough, that you're not worthy, that you're an imposter, that something's wrong with you, something's not fair. And when you see other people in the world pretending like oh yeah i've got this together and things are going on and uh, it, it, it can i think it can just trigger some of that yeah that's right like that's how i should be but i think with the the bravest among us the heroes the courageous leaders among us the ones that are truly courageously display vulnerability tactfully of course build that sense of connection that sense of belonging because they say me too me too i struggle too I'm human too. I'm, I, I don't know things. I'm, I'm here to try, but I, I don't know. Do you want to mm. come along this journey with me? And I think mm. that can be very, very powerful for people because we're all dealing with them. And so I think within your story, right? Um, I think that there are a lot of echoes of, of that truth that we're all just trying to kind of move forward in this world. And I think that the most powerful thing that anyone can feel is seen understood um and heard right so yeah i think that's or spot on george i think you're right you know and and neurodiversity transcends sex race age right it it does because it it's it's kind of feel i found a tribe right of the people I've been talking to, you know, I have friends who are neurodiverse, but, but as I continue along this journey of, of, of this, this podcast and, and what I'm learning from others around the world and their origin stories, their, you know, their, you know, quirks and behaviors and, 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 and challenges and, and what I'm learning and, and, and hopefully kind of sharing with others as well is what a wonderful wonderful thing we have in the world to have this thing called neurodiversity and i don't know that there was um, a gentleman a professor at the university of philadelphia released some research recently to say um and I, I can send this to you as well but it was fascinating because what he said was and again it's specific to adhd was that adhd may 
you know, there's a belief that there's a, it's genetic, right? I don't know how true that is, but if if the formation of the brain and the frontal lobe is to be believed, which I think is is true, then you know there may be a genetic element to it. But he said that there may be a genetic reason for ADHD, and they took two groups of people, one set with ADHD and one set without and they sent them foraging if you're going out and you find berries and 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 stuff like that and he said very clearly the group with adhd didn't spend as much time um with the berries you know at each berry bush and they were picking these berries and moving on really quickly and 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 they were responsible the behaviors of that set of adhd is doing that foraging exercise versus those that weren't was very clearly different and when it comes down to survival which is, you know, that 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 type of behavior because you, we need to eat to survive. You know, they found very distinctly that that was the case. You know, the transit of humans from you know one place to another. He said that non ADHD people um, would tend to settle in one place and not travel anywhere. Whereas ADHD is, and I know from my own experience and our conversations about me traveling to your part of the world in many times in the past, you know, I, I, I get a buzz out of that. Um, I get the dopamine hit from new experiences and, and traveling to new places. Um, I don't know. Have you seen that research or not? It's- I have. Yeah. And I, I, I find it uh, fascinating. I, I think sometimes to me, I think the important, one of the important things I kind of take out of it is I think sometimes because we're all, you know, in a, in a period of time, we think that this is how we always were as humans, like how we are now. But if you look over like the span of of, of time, 90% plus of our time was on a safari or <laughs> on a savanna, right? Um, our brains were really never made and are still never, we're still never programmed to deal with the amount of input that we're dealing with now. And we've set up, you know, these systems, right? Starting with the, the, the farming, the farmer, agricultural revolution, industrial revolution to like everyone stay here. And we said, all right, we're going to come up with these rules of how we want to have a society live. But they're not like inherent in nature, right? People just made it up, right? And so I think sometimes stories like that kind of remind me and I try to remind others, it's like, There's nothing inherently wrong with how you live. As a matter of fact, if you were born in other times, there may be way more advantageous reasons to think in the way that you did. So you are more of the, often called the hunter, right? Um, And can kind of go out and experience things. Um, What we've set up systems that don't necessarily cater to those things, but that doesn't mean that there's something that's wrong with you. And so I find it frankly, just a kind of a good reminder that, you know, to have a little bit of a healthy detachment towards thinking that like we're, you know, society is set up in this, you know, perfect way. And that, you know, the problems with me, because it's, it's not, it's uh, not, at least I no. don't believe so. No, I, I'm, wi- I'm with you. It, it, it isn't. And, but it's also very interesting. I, I've thought about this quite a bit and like I have a 10 year old son and you know, the big thing is any parent and I'm sure it's the same, you know, stateside as well is, you know, get off that damn screen, right? Screen time is the big thing. But I was, I was talking to somebody the other day who said, but George, when books first came about, people would say, Hey, stop sitting in the corner, reading that book. That's bad for you. Get outside and play. Right. And they'd say that to to kids. Now, as parents, if you like, and, you know, we say, is screen time kids? And there was a bad for kids, too much screen time, bad for kids. And there was a parent in an article recently over here in Ireland that said, I put no restrictions on my kids uh, screen time. And, you know, they've grown up and they're, they're, they're really intelligent. They've now got jobs, you know, and so on. And so on. I don't know the answer to that. And I certainly don't know where I'm going with the story either. But what I, what I do know is that um, there was another study done in the UK and they talked about a typical family in 19, so 50 years ago, that, you know, two kids, the kids would go to school, they'd come back and the dad would go to school uh, to, to work and the mum might stay at home or might go to work depending on, you know, the, the, the setup, if you like. And during that day, that 24 hour period, each individual within that family unit might have 
about 100 to 200 mental inputs in 19. Fast forward to 20, that's a inputs. And I, I kind of want to say, you know, no wonder folks like us sometimes get overwhelmed, right? Yeah. That's, yeah. that's way too heavy. Yeah. What's your view of that as a matter of interest? I, I think think that there is a reason why there has been a, a major uptick in those that are being more diagnosed and felt their story more captured within these diagnoses of ADHD, of autism, of OCD, of anxiety. I think that, yes, their genetics certainly certainly do play a role, right? How much are susceptible to a certain thing, right? You're dealing mm. with, when you're dealing with the brain, you're dealing with the nervous system. It's not as if it's like, oh, you are, you know, you're, 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 there's something in the brain that says this is ADHD and this is autism. It is a collection of different traits and different things. And I think the bubble has expanded as the input has increased, both for folks who are maybe not ADHD, who experience more ADHD symptoms, and also those that or ADHD, but in a different time would have been just fine and probably survived in the world and never have had to have this quote unquote label of something. And the same goes, I would say, uh, you know, I don't know about necessarily all the other divergences, but I can say the same thing certainly for autism, right? It's, I think they're just really low, so lower support needs. I'm not the first probably person within my family who is autistic, but I don't think that they, I think most of my, um, you know, relatives and, and, and folks probably didn't have to deal with as much sensory input, with as much need for understanding uh, social communication issue, you know, uh, systems and different things, mm -hmm. right? They could live a little bit, you know, either, right? My, my great grandfather lived on a farm. You can be, you know, you don't have to worry about so much about social communication when you're on a farm, right? And so I think... Um, it's expanded a lot. And also, of course, we have new technologies where communication is just so much faster, right? You have like, you know, TikTok and YouTube and things and people can share their stories more easily. And so I think that there's also, you know, more awareness. And I think these two things kind of collide. And I think that's why you're seeing these uptecks of, of, of folks that are, you know, understanding these, these new neurodivergent types. Yeah. I, do you know, you, you raise a good question, actually. We've got a, here in Ireland, we have a, not a very big space, admittedly, but we do have a, a reasonably large agricultural population, right? And when I say large, I mean, I'm talking about half a million, not not the, the many millions that you'd have in the United States. But I, I do wonder, actually, whether or not, and you, you reference farming, I do not know any farmers that would have been diagnosed with ADHD. And I wonder if that's environmentally part and parcel of the thing that the environment and is it is it a you're right we're kind of you know social animals we we somebody proved that we tend to exist in packs of two if you like more or less um and and you know is the environment of of neurodiversity and certainly i, I can't speak for where you live but is the environment of neurodiversity because you know, is it more an urban thing than a not an urban thing? I don't know the answer to that. Yeah, the answer is I, I, I don't know, right? I don't want to make any assumptions. I'm sure nowadays farming looks a lot different than it did back in the days. So I don't want to make any broad assumptions, especially if someone's like, I'm a farmer. Trust me, it affects my life really intensely. Yeah, yeah. But what I will say is that when you think of, you know, ADHD and frankly, autism, you realize, okay, it's Primarily, um, it's it's tied to executive functioning, right? Executive functioning is you know planning, managing, initiating, um, organizing, uh, prioritizing different things, right? It's the front frontal lobes of your brain, right? So it requires a lot of high level um, thinking. And um, when we live in a primarily knowledge worker society now, your prefrontal uh, cortex is being really worked now or for most uh, folks that are at least in corporations and different things. And so when it's part of your livelihood and we've attached it part of our livelihood of like, hey, I need a job, right? And your boss is going, you know, hey, Jim, why didn't you send me that thing on time? You know, hey, Jim, why are you always late? Hey, Jim, um, you know, we're having some, you're having some performance problems or even, and I would say, especially for high performers, right? Which is the folks I typically deal with. So maybe you're not necessarily, you know, going to get fired from your job, but 
you are so overworked and taxed because you are using every amount of thing and you're on your way to burning out. When you're dealing with so many of these complexities in these, you know, very technology advanced world, and we're all dealing with it, but especially when you are neurodivergent, yeah, of course it's going to affect you a heck of a lot more than if you were living, you know, in, in, in nature and perhaps a little bit more attuned to how your brain naturally works. Mm, um, mm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I would tend to agree with you on that, actually. It's what's your view on. So I, I was, and, and you're the first person I've asked this question of, right? Give it to me. Um, right. And, and, and it's very interesting. So therapy, coaching, things like that. And, and there's been some research to say talking therapy is great. Coaching's great. You know, whether it's for neurodiversity or anything else. But there's no substitute for going out and just getting on with it, right? And this comes from, I was very fortunate um, last year, to last February, a year ago, this last month, actually, to meet um, David Goggins. Do you know the name? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Who is David um, Goggins? D David Goggins is uh, an African-American gentleman who, I, I don't know where he was from. But he did the um, the Navy SEALs training twice, right? Not once, but twice. He then went and he does these ultra marathons, like ridiculous marathons, you know, like 100 miles in the desert, or he'll do seven marathons in seven days, like one every day. He's an incredible human being, tremendous background story right it's in his books and you know very abusive father uh to, to his mother and and brother and all of that stuff right terrible upbringing. i mean really emotionally tragic abusive classic but but beyond he had heart surgery he had scans on both his knees and discovered there was no cartilage in either of his knees and yet he still ran these ultra marathons right and you know his resilience and his tenacity towards just grinding is beyond belief so th the question is is and and again i i i'm i have an adhd coach myself by the way right kevin mm -hmm. i do mm -hmm. and and i value her incredibly with you know keeping me on track and and moving forward in life and and but someone also said the definition of the success of knowing that you've kind of got past it is that you're doing stuff where you forget that you have a condition, right? You mm -hmm. know, and, 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 you know, mm -hmm. you know, the ultimate definition of not being depressed anymore is that you never consider that you are because you're doing something else. And I often think about David Goggins as he's out there and he's running these marathons and he does this thing. Oh God, I'm going to get this wrong now. I think in it's in the summer he does, are they called fire jumpers where they're, they're forest fires in the States and they jump out of these places and they kind of take on board these, these big fires somewhere in the States anyway. Um, and he does this job and it's not very well paid. And he's, he's very wealthy now because of his, his story that he tells and the books he sold, but he goes and does this just because he wants to continue to prove to himself. And I'm fascinated by that paradigm because I've often wondered, should I, and, and I'm talking subjectively about me now, not about the rest of the world. So anybody wow. who's listening to this, please don't, don't take this as read. But I just often <laughs> think to myself, George, if you just shut up and go and do something and get on with it, maybe you'll forget you've ADHD and those behaviors are there to make you successful anyway. Right. I, I don't know. You know, it's a, it's a power. Yeah, it, it is a little bit of a paradigm. And there's several thoughts I actually have on this, um, which is super interesting. The first thought is, as a coach, I am actually a little bit more curious about who, what was it? David, David Goggins was his name? Yeah, David who Goggins. David Goggins really is. Because <laughs> I go, okay, that's your marketing. Great marketing. Good job. And it's not obviously taking away any, I'm sure, very intense brave bouts of different things, right? People can do extraordinarily incredible things, right? But as a, as a coach, I'm always attached to the human condition and empathy. And I often know that there are reasons under what makes people do certain things. 
And I am curious within Dave Goggins, it's like, what demons are you working through under that? And how are you managing those things? Because again, I'm trying to connect to the real person and the real human. And the reality is no human is perfect. No human can do all of these things and everything's kind of a bit of a front. So the people that are like the ones that are like, I'm doing this and look at me doing that. Look at me doing that. I kind of go like, great, that's a good mask. Very good. I see it. <laughs> You're well done and give you credit for. But I also kind of go a lot of times the real the real lessons and the real things that I can understand and connect to are under that. Right. Um, so that's kind of the first kind of thing, just from a general kind of coaching perspective. Yeah. yeah. Um, the, the other thing I do think of as well is I think, especially with, 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 I would say with men and I will just take my own experience with this. I've had several times where I've had to understand that I have ADHD. The first time I think I was actually diagnosed with ADHD um, you know, back in uh, probably 2010s or whatever. I remember like, I talked to my psychiatrist, like give ADHD, basically <laughs> here's some, here's some pills, paraphrasing a little bit, but like didn't do much and just kind of gave it pills and pills were helpful. So I was like, okay, good, cool. Fix ADHD. Now let me just work hard. And I would work really, really hard. Just Kevin, no excuses. Just get it done, get it done. And then inevitably I would trip, I would fail. Something would happen where I would just get my butt kicked. And then I would kind of look my wounds and go, oh, man, it sucks. All right. All right. All right. Well, okay. Well, this time, this time I'm going, I'm going, I'm going all in. Let's go. And I would move in. I'm like, all right, uh, you know, new job. Uh, let's go. You know, you know, moving, moving forward. And then I would just hit the wall again. And that has happened over and over and over again. Usually around about two years in, I would hit this wall <laughs> for probably four, five, six times. And it was probably on the seventh time that I had to just acknowledge the reality of like, Kevin, you have ADHD. <laughs> you are artistic. You are disabled. It doesn't mean that you are less than, but there are realities that you have to accept. And the thought of just working harder and just rubbing dirt on it and just pushing your way through because no one's going to tell me what I'm doing is not a successful strategy. There is more to it that needs to be involved. And so when I hear that story, I hear all of the people that are like watching that and going, oh, he did it. He, he, he can jump through fires. I'm going to do that too. I'm going to do that too. And I hear a lot of people on the way to just building out, hitting walls and doing because inevitably things are always more complicated and harder than they look. Um, the third thing that connects with that though is I still, with that said, that doesn't mean that implementation, that trying, that moving forward and not necessarily always just spending too much time in reflection and healing your childhood wounds isn't also an important, I think, portion of growth and activity. It can be sometimes a form of hiding by just going, you know, I'm just gonna, you know, feel sorry for myself and think about, you know, all of, all of the ways I've been burned and wrong, right? That's not necessarily healthy either. I think the yeah. best of us, the most courageous ones of us are the ones, um, I really resonate with a lot of what Brene Brown's, this is Brene Brown, uh, different things, but like being in the arena, failing in the arena, recognizing you're going to get your ass kicked in the arena, but doing it anyway. So my motto is as fast as I can, as slow as I need reminding myself, I'm going, I'm going, I can, I'm going to do this, but I'm also going to give myself the, the love, compassion, and patience, and frankly, guides and support because no one does it on their own. No, no. one, the biggest no, no, no. is this idea of individualism. I'm Agreed. giving myself the, the guidance to be able to do it along and then recognize that as I go on that journey, I'm going to grow. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna get my ass kicked, but I'm also going to grow. I hope you can spur on this because I said oh, that. Oh, you can. Oh, times. you can say anything okay. you want. Absolutely. Fantastic. But, but that's so that's some of the things I take away from what you're saying. Do you know what I loved there was when you said, I'm gonna use my story and you just told my and you just told my story as well, that whole <laughs> cycle, the cycle mm -hmm. of two years doing the stuff and 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 right. it's it's kind of amazing how you know, how many times I've been fired from jobs in the past, right? And, and you know, just because of you know, the thing kicks in and it's no longer exciting. I don't get the dopamine from it. And, you know, fortunately, you kind of learn techniques now with the support system and the support yeah. network around you. 
But and one no thing, one, can I just say real quickly, Jordan, please, and yeah. no one, because I think this is so important, this is the iceberg effect, and no one sees that. No. All they do is see, what look, at, like, George has got it together. George has got a podcast. Look at, look how well-spoken George is. Look how all these amazing things. Oh, gosh, I just got to move like George. Not realizing that under your what your success, the seeming success is a pile of pain and failure. And I think part of the journey of that vulnerability and opening up is showing a little bit more of that. So people have better expectations of what life really looks like. Exactly. So and the two feet. That. No, no, thank you as well. And the two feet underneath the water flapping like, like, like a duck, you know, but desperately trying to keep steady on, on top, you know, and stuff. Yeah. It, it's fascinating. One thing that Stephen Bartlett, the diary of his CEO guy came up with was, and I thought it was fascinating that he t talked a little bit about his own ADHD and his own success. And many, you know, many people who are successful in, in business and in life, you know, certainly from afar, will attribute that success to, to your point, getting their ass kicked, failing many times and, and only learning through failure. And what's very interesting is, is Steve, Stephen um, has a, um, in his one of his companies, his, his, I guess it's his corporate company. He has a head of failure, right? Yeah, absolutely. Oh, is, yeah. is this kind of a thing in the States? Or do... I, yes, it has waves, right? I think, you know, the many different things. I think a lot of it comes out of Silicon Valley kind of fail fast mentality. Um, yeah. But there are some definitely some things that I, I personally resonate with with failure, but you know, any, like any word you can associate different things with it. Right. So, you know, you don't necessarily have to say failure, but I am a big learner, right? And my value is understanding knowledge and, and using that to wisdom. Right. And I realize that if I know everything, if I'm not having any kind of struggle, I am not growing. I'm not learning. I'm not moving forward and I will eventually stagnate. So if yeah. I am in many ways, not failing, I am, there's that, that's a, that's a big failure. And that's a big problem. It's that's huge. A, that's probably the worst failure. The worst yeah. failure is not doing Not to anything. fail. Yeah. Right. Because that's, that's ignorance. That's yes. ignorance. That's stupidity, you know, and insanity. Right. And so, um, yeah. Anyway, go ahead. Continue. No, I love it. I love, I love listening to you talk about this actually. And the, the kind of the animation that just came out around, you know, yeah. no, exactly. around the, the, the thinking process as well. It kind of, I'm getting not just the passion out of this and, but the sense of we've kind of dissed the, the technology a little bit from the, the massive amounts of inputs, but, but two of the big, big benefits for technology for me is if I want to learn something, I can go right now and learn that thing right now, you know, very yeah. quickly. And I'm very grateful for that. I'm also very grateful for technology allowing me to have the opportunity of talking to you today as well. Because we without that, you know, you know, our paths may never have crossed. And just just the understanding, you know, the 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 story that you have your origin story if you like growing up you know your, your later diagnosis of of autism and you know your, your journey professionally to that and 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 you know those learnings and and I'm, I'm very grateful actually I really am for that look I've got one more question if I may well actually two the first is not a question it's more of a statement would you come back in about six months time and have another chat with me? I would love to George. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, yes. No, it's, absolutely. it's a, and thank you for that. But, but the last question as we wrap up and I really could go on forever, but I, I, I kind of feel we've got an arc. If I yeah, okay. could, if, if I had a magic uh, ability and I could snap my fingers and say, Kevin, I'm going to take away your neurodiversity right now. Would you? <laughs> Would you want that? I wouldn't know who I am. I, this is my autism kind of coming in, but it's like, I don't even understand that. Cause it's like, if you weren't a human, what would, you know, what, 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 what would you be? <laughs> and well, I guess you could answer that question in some ways, but the idea of it is my, my neurodivergence is my, is, is me. It's, it's my personality. It's how I in take and understand the world. And yeah, there, I would say there are certain traits that I think can be disabling for me and this can, environment that I sometimes would like to, you know, lower down. I would like to, you know, feel less anxious. I would like to not always get so hyper fixated um, on, on things and, and be able to move forward. Um, sometimes I can struggle with 
the nuances of different things. But even those things, like I said, like a lot of the, you know, and some, I think sometimes when people kind of see me, they kind of go like, oh, you know, you're charismatic. You seem like you have a, you know, good understanding of, you know, the, you know, certain areas and different things. And I go like, this is all from failure. This is because I would say the wrong thing. So I learned, well, what is the right thing to say? Um, you know, um, I, I want to like live in the world and what's the best ways to live in the world. And so I, you know, you learn and take in some of these things. And so, you know, going all around your question, but the idea of it to answer kind of fully is I would, I think ultimately even the, the things that sometimes I associate with the challenges of being neurodiverse are ultimately the things that move me forward and allow me to grow and to push forward. So I would. I, I think that certainly I love who I am. I sometimes wish society and social and the things around me would be a little bit more on my team, if that makes yeah. sense. Yeah, no, I share exactly your thinking. On great days, I'm like, absolutely, you know, I'm going to change the world and, and, and society will catch up. I'm just, you know, was born at the wrong time, right? And I, But I yeah. think also, you know, I, I'll tell you this, I, you know, despite, the problems in the world i think the the neurodiversity for me personally has brought me to a tribe of people that i didn't think that i would ever have the great pleasure and opportunity to spend time with and 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 i'm grateful to have met you today i really thank am you. So, you thank you so George. much for that and you know I, I wish you all the best for the future and i will be emailing you because i'm going to set a timer for myself a, a reminder now and and just you know bring you back and, and maybe come onto a panel with some other folks as well and and yeah and, enjoy that and, and, and do that great and no but thank you so much um kevin bailey you've been an absolute delight sir thank you so much thank you george it's been a, uh, a pleasure i appreciate it and this honestly didn't even feel like a podcast it just felt like two 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 folks having a good conversation so thank exactly. you for making me feel so comfortable Oh, it's a pleasure. I'm just going to press pause for a sec, if that's okay yeah, on the absolutely. recording. And if you just, just hold on for a sec. Of course.